everybody and um, I can see you all now which is uh, nice. <laughs> Welcome to um, uh, to members and to members of the public um, to the Develop Man Development Management and Licensing meeting on the 9th of November. Um, my name is Julie Elland and I'm the chairman of the committee. Um, just to let everybody know that the meeting is being live streamed. Okay, so it'll be going out on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And of course, you can watch it back if you're minded so to do at a later date. We are um, not expecting a fire drill. So in the event that the fire alarm does go off, it'll be for real. So please, could you make your way back down the stairs now throughout of the building? And we will meet at the far end of the car park. Um, Mr. White, you the fire marshal? Today I am, Chair. Thank you. Me. Thank you. So follow Mr. White, who is there. Okay. Um, so uh, as... Um, as, as members are aware, but obviously we have we have members of the public here. This is a public meeting, um, and um, if you're registered to speak, then you will be called forward at the appropriate time of the meeting. Um, if you're not a registered speaker, then I'm afraid you won't be able to take part. Um, could I just ask just a little bit of housekeeping with registered speakers, um, just to keep everybody as COVID secure as possible. When you do come forward to speak, if you could pick up a microphone and um, put it on the podium and then just press the button on the front to turn it on and, uh, and say your piece. Um, and then when you've finished, if you just turn it off and pop it under the table, that just makes sure everybody gets a, a fresh microphone each time. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, so in terms of how the planning applications are presented, there is an order that we do work our way through, which is that the case officer will present their report. Um, registered speakers will be called forward in um, a specific order and um, followed by the ward member who will have an opportunity if he or she wishes to. Members of the committee will be able to question each speaker, but just on points of clarity. OK, and um, then after all the questioning is done, then the officer recommendation is just removed and seconded. And that's just to enable it to go into debate. That's not an indication of how anybody is going to vote. Once then we go to the debate, then members will vote and will come to a decision. OK. So before we start, I'm going to just ask, we have our officers here and Vice Chair, I'm just going to ask um, them to introduce themselves. Mr. Fairburn, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm David Fairburn. I'm Head of Legal Services and Monitoring Officer and the Legal Advisor to the Committee this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Councillor Terry Pierce. I'm Vice Chair of the DM Committee. and I'm also a member of the Devon Building Control Partnership. Good morning, I'm Pat Weimer, I'm Head of Development Management for South Hams and West Devon. I'm Bryony Hanlon, I'm one of the planning officers. Good morning everyone, I'm Daryl White, I'm Democratic Services Manager for the Council and note taker for this meeting. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Councillor Caroline Mott, thank you. And good morning, um, I'm um, Councillor Barry Ratcliffe and I'm a member for the Exporn Ward. And I'm also, I like to declare a personal interest in all applications by virtue of being a member of the Devon Building Control Partnership. Councillor Tony Leach, Oakhampton North. <laughs> Councillor Mark Renders, uh, I represent the Dartmoor Ward, West Devon. Uh, Steve Hipsey, Ward Member for Tavistock North. Councillor Terry Southcott. Councillor Paul Vashon representing Oakhampton South. Councillor Diana Moyes from Burrittal Ward. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you for the uh, declaration of interest preempting. We will get there. Um, Councillor Vashon, can I just ask when you do turn your microphone on if you can bring it a little bit further forward? The reason being it doesn't get picked up on the live stream if um, the, the, so you, you know, people aren't here. Thank you. So, um, item one, we'll move on to the agenda. Item one, apologies for absence, Mr. White. Thank you, Chair. We have no apologies for absence and a full house of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. And um, item two is declarations of interest. And members are invited to declare any personal or disclosable pecuniary interests, including the nature and extent of such interests they may have in any items to be considered at this meeting. Councillor Ratcliffe has already declared his. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Hipsey? Uh, yes, declare an interest in case 303021HHO, 
Um, clearly, um, uh, Councillor Spedicu, the applicant, is a colleague and a very good friend. However, I'm sure I can deal with that impartially. Okay, so yes, you do confirm that um, you've had no dealings with him with regard to this application. You've come with an open mind. That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. I'll declare a personal interest as a member of the management board of the Devon Building Control Partnership. Thank you. That's everybody, I think. Lovely, thank you. Item three is items requiring urgent attention and there aren't any at this time. Item four, which is confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 12th of October 2021. Um, there is one amendment which is on page one regarding attendance list, um, which shows Councillor Peter Crozier as present. In actual fact, it should be Councillor Terry Southcott. Um, apart from that, is everybody happy that I sign them as a true and accurate record? Lovely. Okay, thank you. And um, I will sign those um, before the end of the meeting. Okay. Um, item five is just a correction of the minutes of the meeting of the 14th of September 2021. Um, there was an informative um, post meeting that was added to the minutes and as um, outlined on the agenda. So they actually don't form part of the record actually of the meeting. It was just an informative that was added afterwards. So again, is everybody happy that um, I sign those with the associated um, amendment? Thank you. Item six is the planning application. So we move to our first application, which is item 3030 forward slash 21 slash HHO, which is 52 Westmore Park, Tavistock. And the planning officer is Bryony Hanlon. So I will pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So this application is actually a householder. There's a slight typo on that um, first slide there. So we're at 52 Westmore Park in Tavistock. Um, here's the site plan. So it's part of a well-established uh, residential area. Um, here's the aerial view, just to give you an idea of the layout and density of the buildings. So we have a detached bungalow, and the applicant wishes to construct a single-storey rear extension, which you can see here in that teal colour. There's a small area of deck around the outside. And then if you move to the right hand side of the plan, you can see there's a small outbuilding um, and that will be replaced. So these are the elevations. Again, you can see the new areas um, kind of highlighted in teal, single storey rear extension set below the main ridge line with the decked area. And then the second slide shows you the existing single storey garage at the bottom um, and then the like-for-like -like replacement at the top. And here's the site photo. So it shows you the front elevation of the bungalow with the detached garage just down to the side. You can see here from the condition of the um, detached garage, it's quite in quite a poor state. So the applicant simply wants to replace it. And then this is the rear elevation. So the single storey extension will go to the left hand side of the photo. And then here is a picture of the street scene, just to give you an idea of um, the character of the area, really. Um, the application is recommended for approval, and obviously it's been called to committee because the applicant is Councillor Spetiku. Thank you. Um, any questions for the planning officer, members? Yes, Chairman. Could we go back to the original um, plan where this right so it's the garage that's being replaced with a store and the garden shed is staying there which is up in the top corner am I correct in thing right okay thank you okay any other questions members okay um, obviously because Ms. Uh, Councillor Spetsky is a councillor so he's can't be present. Um, it's, it's one of the rules that we have that a councillor cannot be present during the determination of his application. So his agent has um, very kindly come along, is, is not actually, doesn't wish to register to speak. However, will, if um, any member does have any questions that the planning officer can't answer, then he is prepared to um, come forward to the podium and answer those questions. 
So does any member have a, a question that they would like to put to the agent? No, looks like not. Okay, thank you. Um, just change my glasses a minute, sorry. Okay, so the actual recommendation um, for this one is actually on page seven of your agenda, and the recommendation is conditional approval as described. Um, and I am happy to move that recommendation. Is there a seconder, please? Happy to second, Chairman. Thank you. We are now in debate, members. Anybody wish to speak? Okay. All right, thank you. Then we will take this one straight to the um, vote. Then all those in favour, please show. That is unanimous. Thank you, Chair. Lovely. Thank you very much. So we'll just pause a minute for a change of planning officer. Okay, so we will now move on to the next application. Now, what we have here is, is um, two applications, which is 3087 forward slash 20 full and 308820 listed building consent, both um, for the same property, for the same um, nature of the application. They have to come through as two separate ones. So um, just to, for simplicity, really, the planning officer will make one presentation to members, okay, and the, the registered speakers have, will have twice the normal amount of time to which to speak. Um, but we will need to take two separate votes on the two different applications. However, we will just have that one presentation at the start. Okay, so um, over to you, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Uh, and just to introduce yourself, if you would, please. Yes, I'm Graham Lawrence. I'm a heritage specialist for West Devon and South Hams councils. We'll begin as usual with uh, the site plan, identifying the location of the property and the aerial photograph. These are the drawings as existing um, and as proposed. And we have sections here. I'm going to continue through some photographs just to show members for those who weren't on the committee site visit. I'll come back to that one. This is a view of the rear of the property showing it in relation to the setting of the main listed farmhouse. This is a view from the parking area to the south, um, showing again the relationship with the main house. Slightly closer view. And just as a bit of background information, that's uh, the second edition and ordnance survey map, um, which shows that this building has been in place for some considerable time. Just returning back to the drawings as proposed. Yeah, uh, the building is a small barn, approximately five metres to the west of the Grade 2 listed farmhouse. It has a modern roof structure. It was thatched. The thatch remains, but it's decaying and is presently covered in plastic sheeting, as you've seen. As I've said, to the south, there is a row of three pigsties, which are only the remnants of the walls remain. The site is considered to be integral to the setting of the listed building and is itself a curtilage listed structure and it contributes positively to the character of the conservation area. The development is described in the application as alteration extension to existing farm buildings to form additional living accommodation for the use of family members or holiday guests. On the latest revised plans, there's an additional annotation which says that the use will be initially as a visitor self-catering holiday unit which is considered a, you know, an accurate uh, representation of how it's intended to be used. Uh, the applications are supported by the Parish Council, and we had an objection from the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings who recommended refusal due to the level of unnecessary and unjustified harm it would cause. In considering the applications, we've, had, uh, we've applied all local 
and national policy and guidance. And in particular, I would refer to paragraph 200 of the National Planning Policy Framework, which says any harm to or loss of the significance of a designated heritage asset from its alteration or destruction or from development within its setting should require clear and convincing justification. Furthermore, paragraph 202 of the MPPF says, where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal. So the main concerns regarding the proposal are the changes to its appearance um, and the, its alterations. So there's the changes to the roof material from thatch to um, a, a metal um, sheet material. There's the changes to the form and the height of the roof, the raising of the front wall as well. The fact that there are extensions to both the north and south with lean-to roofs, which are not considered um, sympathetic to the form of the building as it is now or as it was historically. And then there's also the partial demolition of original historic fabric. Uh, the internal photos showed where, um, where um, a hole would be punched through to access the kitchen, which you'll see at the bottom left-hand corner of the proposed drawings there. We discussed at the site visit how the change of levels um, will require uh, excavation in that location which hasn't really been adequately represented in the, uh, in the information that's been provided. There's also no schedule of works for the repair to the um, historic building. Another thing that we've applied in consideration of the application is our barn guide, which forms part of the supplementary planning document, uh, which is a, an adopted adjunct to the joint local plan. And in my report, I've quoted uh, one small part of that, which I think is particularly relevant. And it says that every change being proposed, whatever its size or purpose, needs to be examined in terms of the necessity for it, the impact it will have, and whether alternatives exist. As officers, we consider that the proposal as designed imposes changes of built form and materials that are unnecessary. The changes will cause harm to the character of the small barn and to the setting of the main listed building and to the character and appearance of the conservation area. For those reasons, the recommendations for refusal as set out in the two reports. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Could you just go to the photograph of the intern of the actual internal? Yeah. Thank you. Because that reminded that some people went on the site visit. And are you able to explain exactly what people are looking at there? Thank you. Yes. Uh, you can see the joist holes there show the level of the historic floor or tallet, it may have only been a partial floor, it's uncertain, but there aren't holes on the other wall, uh, I don't think. Uh, there, there is a proposed partial demolition through that wall to link through into the um, proposed kitchen extension to the north, the height of which would be roughly, I'm guessing, where the, uh, where the joist holes are, but because the existing or the historic floor level isn't identified on the plans accurately, it's difficult to tell for certain, but it is a concern that this is you know, unspoilt historic fabric from around about the 18th century, we believe, and that that partial demolition is unnecessary. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Um, in that case, I should like to invite um, the first of our visiting speakers up. And first up is Mrs. Courage, who is the applicant. So if you'd like to come on up and grab yourself a microphone. Okay. There's a button on the side that you might need to press in first and that can uh, that's yeah that's and then the press on, button on the front that's stays on wonderful okay so um you will have six minutes okay you, you're welcome to if you if you whichever you're comfortable with um you you will have six minutes um mr white will be keeping an eye on the time and he will just give you a warning um as you're heading towards the end of your six minutes and i will need to ask you to to finish when you get to the six minutes okay thank you 
Uh, good morning, everyone, and many thanks for allowing our planning application to be appraised by your full committee, where hopefully a more balanced opinion can be reached. I have a lot I would like to say, but I'm conscious that three minutes is not long enough to cover everything properly, so I would suggest that you make notes while I'm speaking of anything you would like to question me on further at the end. Our application clearly states that the new accommodation created through the conversion and extension of this previously agricultural building would form part of our current B&B &B business and also provide a self-contained independent living accommodation fam for family members. This has always been the case. General planning rules allow for conversion of this type of building, as we have witnessed in our village over the last few years. These developments have been allowed within a conservation area, sometimes on sites of historic interest, but without the restrictions that are being imposed on us, simply because they did not require listed building consent. The restoration of previously dilapidated buildings has significantly improved the overall character of the village. We have kept our proposal small whilst needing to achieve a sustainable use for the building. To be viable, we must be able to achieve a self-contained living accommodation, even more important to us now than before the pandemic. We have considered DDA compliance and do not agree that there has been a lack of consideration, contrary, contrary to MPPF paragraph 130F, unless, of course, you take it out of context and fail to take note of the, the additional footnote, footnote attached to it. To make use of the existing footprint makes more sense to us than the suggestion by your heritage officer of a modern, contrasting addition to the rear of the building, which would be contrary to MPPF paragraph 130, A, B and C. He has demonstrated a lack of clarity in providing important information with regards to the final design, constantly contradicting previous advice he has given and obstructing the progress of this application. A full survey of the site has been carried out and all relevant measurements, including levels and depth of footings, have been provided with the revised application and these details are available for all to scrutinise. Had I been allowed to speak at the site meeting, I could even have shown everyone the hole we have dug next to the north wall to establish the depth of the footings. Uh, last Thursday's site meeting provided you with an opportunity to view firsthand the setting of Middletown Farmhouse within Sanford Courtney and the character of the village as a whole. At present, our dilapidated barn is an eyesore, which despite our best efforts to protect it from the elements, continues to deteriorate as the months pass. In reply to Mr Lawrence's referral to MPAPF 196, we cannot be held responsible for its continued decay when we have taken every measure to protect it and indeed wish to restore it. I would like to address some of the concerns raised in the Heritage Officer's report, as we believe he has unfairly overlooked available information in a bid to discredit our application. In response to the statement that our proposal is contrary to Dev 21.1, 2 and 6 of the Joint Local Plan and MPF paragraph 200, on grounds that the design and materials will harm the setting of the Grade 2 listed farmhouse, May I point out that we have already agreed to use traditional materials where appropriate, including a corrugated metal roof, as indicated on the right revised plans. And we've even removed the, the featherboard cladding that um, was originally suggested. On the advice of Mr Lawrence, our plans have been redrawn on several occasions over the past year, each time taking on board the new information presented to us, only to have the goalposts moved further away again. Um, Mr Lawrence had sought support from the, the SPAB. Their request for further information and photographic evidence were not passed on to us or our agent, as the two SPAB reports are based purely on information provided by Mr Lawrence and contain inconsistencies, and also their impression of the building, its setting and the surrounding area is not first-hand. We question its credibility. Mr Lawrence's report and the SPAB's second report now mention the barn guide, which neither ourselves nor our agent have been made aware of in the last year. To have held back this guidance has been detrimental to the progress and success of our proposal. It became apparent during the site visit that due to a, a lack of historic evidence, our proposal is being determined by guesswork and the per personal opinion of the heritage officer. I have several examples that demonstrate this and will be happy to dis discuss this further. It is claimed that the proposal is judged to be excessive and unwarranted. We disagree that a 2.8 metre extension is excessive and consider this sensitive proposal will facilitate a suitable, sustainable, optimum viable use of the building. And I think there's just one last little bit over the back. 
and no, that was it. Okay, but if I could just comment that the photos taken at site meeting didn't show the whole of the building, um, that they, it just showed the one bit of historic wall, didn't show the condition of the rest of the building from the in internally. And I think that um, doesn't give everyone a true picture of what we actually have there on site. Okay, that's all I need to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If you just want to stay there just a second, just in oh, case sure. anybody, um, and thank you for your contribution, um, just in case anybody does have any questions. Any mem questions, members? Uh, Councillor Renders and Councillor Hipsey. Just a, a very a quick one, and it, it might not be you that can answer this, but the, the two questions that I did, and one I should have asked the office to start, but you might better answer that one. Is the building itself, I know the farmhouse is listed, and I know we've got listed as in the, in the area, is the farm specific, uh, is the, um, the building in this connection specifically a listed building? It's like where I used to be, okay. And the other one is, uh, again, the, the SPAD, did they actually visit or have they just taken their information from, from stuff that you supplied or did you supply them with nothing? Mrs. Courage, Mrs. Mrs. Courage, would you mind just popping your microphone on because otherwise we can't hear, thank you. <laughs> Looking at the two letters that have come from SPAB to Mr. Lawrence, they've both requested further information and photographic evidence. We have never been asked to provide that. They've never on. visited. Okay. Councillor Hipsey. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. Um, can I just clarify, it, it seems that um, I'm sensing that Part of the consideration here is the nature of the roof that you are proposing. Um, I think I heard you say that that proposal may have changed, or did I miss something? Again, microphone, please, if you'd be so. You, it, it turns off, yeah, it right, turns sorry. off automatically okay. if more than two or three. Uh, okay. um, we had the, the, um, the roof on the extensions that we've proposed um, were originally pitched, or we, we were originally wanting pitch. We were advised that um, that wasn't the case. It should be a lean-to type of roof. So we went back to redrawing, came up with the, the um, sloped roofs. Site meeting last week, apparently now they've got to be pitched. We don't know where we stand with this. We're, we've been throwing different information left, right, and center. So it, we originally started with pitched roofs, and we've ended up submitting the proposal with slope trees because that was what we were led to, to believe that we should be doing. But the, the, the material is th that you're proposing still is still a metal roof? A metal roof in, right. in keeping with other properties around that have been converted, right. keeping the agricultural sense to the, the property. There is no evidence that that has always been a thatched roof. Thank you very much. Councillor Vachon. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, that's partially answered my question. Actually, as to whether there's any evidence of what the what the roof was was uh, originally um, covered in, but is there any historical evidence as to what the building was used for in the past? No, no concrete evidence. It's all just supposition. Right. So, it was it was a farm. It had lots of outbuildings. The property opposite us was part of the farm. It has been converted over the years. Other people living in there. And obviously, our little tiny bit of barn that, that's left, perhaps a store for, for feed. No one knows for sure. Um, you know, it is just there with an open doorway, an open window, small, very small. It's just an outbuilding, basically. Okay. Um, but no, no evidence, no, what it was actually used for. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, would you be able to tell me how long you've owned Middletown? Farm, please. Right. Farm we house. moved in in 2015. Right. Okay. And the whole property had been neglected for a long, long while. Um, so we took on a bit of a, a project to bring it, bring some life back into the place. The reason the barn wasn't dealt with straight away was because we had so much to do um, on the house. But at the point that we moved in, we put tarpaulins on the roof of the barn because we could see that the roof was deteriorating, and we wanted to keep the weather out of it. Um, I can say this is probably about the sixth, seventh 
tarpaulin we put up there because the wind just whips through and pulls it off. But um, we have done our level best to protect it until a point where we could actually deal with it, basically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to just clarify something you said. It was just um, where, where the information came from. Um, you said that you, you had been advised originally that the, the extension roofs should be lean-tos and now obviously been told they should be pitched. What I wanted to clarify is who, who gave you that original advice? Was it, it a planning officer or was it your agent or was it, you know, I mean, it no, could have been planning, planning, planning officer. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, anybody? Uh, Councillor Mott. Thank you, Chair. It's probably more appropriate for the officer um, as to what would happen to the building if nothing got approved um, today, for example, regardless of any other applications coming forward and um, what action we would be able to take to help preserve the building should no further applications come forward. Are you Thank you, Sorry. Sorry, Chair. Going to say, um, did Mrs. Courage want to um, respond to that one? I don't think we know where to go from this point. If we can't move forward with the, with the proposal, it's a, a building that is collapsing where it is at the moment. Even even with the coverings on there, you know, we can stand inside and hear bits falling off it. It needs needs to be attended to and quickly, and, and we're prepared to do that but we can't get beyond this point at the moment. And we do feel that our proposal is so much more sympathetic. We use the smallest amount of um, the, the footprint that's there um, with the, the pig's size. You know, the, we've been, it's been suggested that we should now move along to another pig's die and use that for the kitchen extension. It encroaches so much on, on, on the visuals of the whole property within the village. It, it just is nonsense to keep expanding in that direction when, there, when there's already a, a structure to the north side that is tucked out of everyone's line of vision and it's there and it's got even that's got to be attended to. Even if we don't use it as the kitchen, we've still got to rebuild that. We're not just going to get rid of it. It's there. It's part of the building. So it makes sense that it's, it's repurposed into the kitchen and... You know, we're talking about one doorway, one one doorway that takes you through to there. We're not talking about knocking big holes through the whole of the, the heritage wall there. It's a doorway that makes use of that final bit of the building that's there. Um, and this is the stumbling block, is that we can't get beyond this one wall. At the end of the day, we're trying to preserve the building and, and for the whole of the village. Not just ourselves, but the whole of the village. Okay. You know, if we can't, if we can't move on from this point, it will just continue to crumble. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Mott. Did you have a supplementary? I, I did. Pretty, so I just want clarity because you're saying that it's just about putting one opening into that wall. Um, I appreciate it's one opening into that wall, but I, from what I can see on the plans, you plan to push another opening through the other side as well as block up the original doorway, is that correct? Again, mi microphone, if you would please, thank you. Sorry, can I ask that you speak into the microphone? Yes, sorry. Because I'm not sure that, that the, um, the cameras are picking up everything else. The, um, the, the other door going out to the, the lobby area is not going through a historic wall. It, there's been an opening there before, it's been blocked up. So we're going back through there and the, the best part of that wall is concrete block anyway, so we're not destroying anything of any any historic importance there. The blocking up of the, um, the the opening that is there at the moment, and it is just literally an opening, is one because um, if we are having any guests, whether it's family or um, B and B guests there, if they come through that door, they're almost straight in our kitchen door. So if they wouldn't have privacy, we wouldn't have privacy. Okay, we will make that doorway look like the property that's been converted opposite, which was one of our buildings originally, with stained boarding in there. It, it won't look any different to the other buildings within the village that have had the same things done up, done with blocked up doorways. And also, if you have to have an opening doorway there, you limit the amount of space within that living area with doors opening. It, 
you know, it is a small space and we, we are keeping it small because we don't want to encroach any further than we have to um, on the whole of the, you know, the whole of the site there. Okay, that that. anybody else with any further questions? Okay, in that case, um, thank you very much, Mrs. Courage. Your, your yeah. comments have been very, very helpful. Thank if you. I could ask you if you just press the off switch on your, um, and just pop it, that's lovely, and just pop it on the floor, um, then uh, we can make sure the next person picks up a fresh one. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, before we move on, I didn't actually get an answer because I think that's probably best answered by Mr. Lawrence as to what we, action we can take should no approval be granted to maintain the um, structure. That's fine. Um, and when we've listened to all our speakers, then I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to Thank ask you. Mr. Lawrence that question. Okay. Okay. Um, so next we have um, Marion Pratt, who's the clerk to St. for Courtney Parish Council. Again, um, same for you. If you'd be kind enough, um, there's a button on the side which you need to turn on, which is a master switch for want of a better word. Just press that in. And then the um, talk button on the front. Um, thank you very much indeed. Again, you will have six minutes. Mr. White will time you. And as you're getting towards the end, he'll give you a warning. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. When you're ready. Thank you. Uh, the Parish Council have been aware of the ongoing application process and the dialogue with the Heritage Officer regarding the plan to restore the building to the rear of Middletown Farm. The application was considered at a full Council meeting on the 1st of December 2020, also attended by Mr and Mrs Courage. The unanimous decision was that the Sanford Courtney Parish Council were happy to support the application, which would preserve a dilapidated outbuilding in the curtilage of a listed building in the parish. The plans sub submitted were assessed against our parish planning policy and the following key points show how this application fitted our criteria. Number one, the design is in keeping with local properties and still portrays the character of the village. Members would have seen as they walked through the village the character and variety of different properties. It is clear from the information researched and presented that there is no factual evidence of what the original building structure of Middletown Farm looked like but what is proposed is very well in keeping with the local vernacular traditions of surrounding properties of same historic period and a failure to support the renovation of the building will lead to further dilapidation and the current of, the, of the current building, which we feel is far more detrimental to the character of the conservation area. A key aspect of the current designs is, what, is that they, re, they re maintain the footprint of the current building or what remains of it. Number two. The plans which have been updated reasonably acknowledge the advice of SPAB in respect of style, materials and craftsmanship and have been incorporated to complement the features and needs of the parish. When taking into account the changes that the applicants have accepted to align with the advice given by SPAB, members should be aware that far more detrimental designs and options pr were proposed by the heritage officer have been dismissed. With appropriate conditions specifying use of appropriate materials, this would support the fact that SPAB in both reports say they do not object in principle to this conversion. Three, the renovations proposed to a building which the parish council sees as detrimental to the aesthetics of the village will also support both economic sustainability in the parish and have potential to support independent living for the family. We are also satisfied that other environmental and ecological considerations have been made in respect to the renovations. It is, however, disappointing that the option to provide renewable energy has been removed. The recommendation of SPAB was for freestanding solar panels. Members will recognise from the site that this would be impossible and the Parish Council recognise the very delicate line which sits between the preservation of historic buildings and the need to act upon the climate emergency. The use of solar panels is an obvious solution but would have an impact on the character of the curtilage of the listed building, but one in the circumstances should be tolerated. There have been no complaints and only positive comments and support from local residents. Whilst understanding the purpose of the site visit and that our attendance was purely passive, it seemed a missed opportunity that members were not prompted to clarify some of the information given by the Heritage Officer, which has been vague and ambiguous. Key aspects that related to the plans were left unanswered and detrimental comments certainly left the Parish Council feeling that the plans submitted had not been fully consulted. And whilst the plans were available at the time for members to consult, specifics known to the council and the property owner could not be pointed out to offer clarity. Key examples were when it was indicated that distances and measurements of walls and floors, etc., were not included in the plans and were very unclear, which is not the case if the plans are carefully reviewed. 
Thank you for allowing me to speak to this meeting in support of an application to ensure the future of a piece of village history. And in summary, I would ask you to consider the advice given on the West Devon Borough Council planning website regarding listed building consent. Listing is not a preservation order. It is not intended to freeze a building in time. Your works or alterations should be sympathetic to the building and its character and preserve any historic fabric while still allowing you to live in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, do you have any questions? It would appear not, if I could escape. Thank you very much indeed for your time and for your contribution. Okay, um, and then third we have uh, Katz Ratcliffe, who is the ward member who has registered to speak. Um, and again, you do get a little more time if you do need to use all of it. You will have 10 minutes. Okay, um, y yes, it would probably be better if you did. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This, this, I think, is a very simple application for a building which is decaying, as we've seen, and um, as the speakers have gone into great detail, and I will not really repeat everything which has been said before. My thanks to the applicant and the conservation officer for showing dignity with this inquiry and with the, what I believe to be fair statements of opinion. It comes down, I think, to the detailed design of this building. I don't believe it is, is common for full details and, and, and or, or for full details will stop um, to be submitted at this stage of an application. This can be dealt with by conditions. Um, the design materials, landscaping and hard landscaping, can be subject to conditions and um, if, if consent is granted. I think the condition of the building is the dictating factor that it is going to fall down. And um, it, it is, I think, a credit to the area. Um, I think to answer the question which was asked earlier, is, is this building listed? Um, I believe that the conservation officer will say that it isn't listed, but it is within the curtilage of the site. Have I answered that correctly? Um, as a curtilage building, as a historic building within the curtilage of a listed building, it is listed, yeah. and that's you know the legal statement as yeah. in the 1990 Act. Yes, thank you for that. But Sorry. in itself, it is not listed. But that is a. It's not individually that. listed, but it is protected through yeah. the listing of the farmhouse. Yeah. Thank you for that. In in um, in fairness, so really, um, as I say, a simple application, a simple building, and I would welcome a simple building, and I would welcome. Um, that it is, it is considered. I look forward to the debate which is going to follow. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, if you just stay for a moment because our members might well have questions for you. Um, okay. Any questions for Councillor Ratcliffe? I, I mean, I'm one of the things that you were talking about is um, potentially um, that this could be managed through conditions and given that conditions do need to be reasonable um, and, and achievable, um, what sort of things are you thinking about as, as the ward member? Thank you. I think it is things which were mentioned in the site visit and have been all the way through that um, it is mainly the roof and, what, and the roof materials. It is also the external materials of the walls. We have stonework there and we're going to have some new walls which are going there and it's to, make, it's to make sure that that is not stonework if it is cob or whatever it may be or it may be, I think, Cob blocks were mentioned earlier, but at the end of the day, it's going to be rendered and it's been decorated. But I think it is getting the, the balance of those materials correct, how they interface, how they join together, and are producing really what could be a charming little building. Because it sits, when I first went there, I was surprised at how nice it was. It, was, it sits on, on top of a, um, a rise and it's really towering above you, not just sitting on the ground. But um, those, I think, are the principal materials which show from outside. 
and those together with the excavations which go in the corner which the conservation officer mentioned um, and plus the detailing around there to make sure it is really a, a very pleasant little building. After all it's only I think about 30 square meters it's a really a tiny building. Okay thank you. Uh, Councillor Hipsey and Councillor Renders I think. Um, thanks Madam Chair. Um, uh, thank you Councillor um, Ratcliffe. Um, can I just um, draw your attention to a paragraph on page six? I think it's six. We still don't seem to have page numbers. Uh, page six of, uh, of the officer's report. Uh, I'll quote, I'll read it to you. Uh, officers emphasize that there is no fundamental objection to the conversion and even some extension of the outbuilding. But there are so many concerns that they cannot possibly be covered by conditions as suggested in the reasons for the objection of the applications being brought to this committee, uh, which obviously have been put, put forward by you. Um, I find it a little surprising that we have got to the stage where we can't come up with um, enough conditions to, 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 to cover this. And uh, are, are you, in fact, confident that uh, sufficient conditions can be put forward to allow this to happen? Thank you. Can I say firstly that um, I've had no part in the design or any part of the building. Yep. The, the first I heard on this was the applicant um, contacted um, James McInnes and James sent it to me. So it came along, but it was clear that there was difficulty in driving this forward. And I tried as impartially as I can and again without forming opinion to do that. So I have played no part and I can't really comment on what is, what is proposed from that part. Yeah. Um, personally, I think it is, not, it, it is selection of materials. So, and there's probably three materials which you have to select, um, being roof, walls, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that, it, that isn't terribly difficult and I would expect that to be there and I don't see that as a stumbling block. Um, I think the sighting of the extension, the sighting of the extension as shown at the moment, as you face it from the house, um, which is proposed the main one on the right, um, I think that is aesthetically um, perhaps the right position, and, and as shown on, on these drawings. I think the alternative which we looked at at one stage, and I looked at with Graham, and he'll correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, was the possibility of putting the extension to the right, as you look at it, of putting it to the left. But of course that then would have blocked out all of the view that would have blocked out the garden and wasn't particularly successful. Yeah. But I, I think that it has been looked at about as far as it can. And I, I would have thought, because it is so small, it can certainly be dealt with by conditions. And why, by the conditions, you're asking the, the agent, the architect, um, to give you details. And I see these as proper details, almost quarter full size, how it goes together, how the rainwater pipes join how it all goes through. So yes, I, I would have thought reasonably it can. It's not a multi-million pound building. It is something which is quite simple and with goodwill can um, be achieved. Uh, thank you very much. So, so effectively you disagree with the paragraph uh, in the middle of page six that says this can't be done? I, I believe it can. Yeah, thank but, you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Renders, did you have a question for Councillor Ratcliffe? Not for Councillor. I don't think... Uh, Councillor Rankin Ricardo, but I have one one question. But if anybody wants, I might as well, shall I just say anyway? Um, no, if you if you just hang hang on a second, okay, okay we'll um, let uh, get the members question Councillor Ratcliffe because there, there are some things coming forward that we need to pick up with the planning officer and with Mr. Weimer. So, any other questions for Councillor Ratcliffe? No, okay, thank you very much. If you'd, um, yeah, uh, you're the last speaker, so that's fine. <laughs> Okay, if you want to come back and grab your seat as a member of the committee, thank you very much indeed. Um, there are one or two things that we, I think we need to pick up with the um, uh, uh, planning officer. I'm, I'm just going to ask C Councillor Mott, you, you had a question um, which was directed to the applicant and you wish to also direct it to uh, Mr Lawrence. Did you want to do that? Uh, yes, please. It was just really to um, see what measures could be taken to help preserve the building should this application not go forward. Yeah. Um, as it's a listed building and it's, because it's in a conservation area, we could use our urgent works notice powers um, in order to undertake 
the minimum works reasonably necessary to preserve the fabric of the building. So in a situation like this, it would be replacing the roof structure. Obviously, that's only something that we do um, under extraordinary circumstances, not something we do regularly, but that is the power that we have available to us. Thank you. Okay, are you happy with it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Weimer, or Mr. Fairbairn, I'm not quite sure which, um, might want to come in regarding um, the whole issue of conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll come in to start with, and I'm sure Mr. Fairbairn will correct me if I get anything slightly not right. Um, with, with the greatest respect, I'm, I'm going to slightly disagree with the ward member. Um, I think there is a distinct difference between what you can do for conditions on a planning application and what you can do with conditions on a listed building consent application. So where we're talking about roof material, that in itself requires listed building consent, which is why I feel it needs to be on approved plans that get granted listed building consent and can't be deferred to deal with as a condition because the condition consenting process in itself doesn't grant listed building consent. Listed building consent needs to be as part of the application. So whilst I would agree that there are a number of things that can be dealt with by condition, particularly the, the bits that when you talked about landscaping, absolutely that can as part of the planning can, planning conditions. But as far as listed building consent is concerned, if it's if it's works to the listed building, in my view, that needs to be on the listed building consent and cannot be deflected or deferred to conditions. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Mr. Fever? Uh, yeah, Chairman, I entirely agree. I think it's a case of where the works are so integral to the the building itself. Um, you need to be satisfied. Um, that no harm is going to be caused. And you can't leave that to a matter of details. Uh, you need to know those details now to decide whether or not harm would be caused by a particular uh, material or otherwise. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Members, do you have any further questions? Councillor Renders. Um, yeah, just going uh, back to the comments by SPAB and uh, they mention, um, it's a bit ambiguous, but it's a bit vague. Um, but they, again, they're in favour that building could possibly take place on this. But their argument or their, their point is the, the use of more appropriate materials. I would like to know if anybody, or our planners, what would perhaps be a bit more indicative of what those actual appropriate materials are because it could mean a multitude of things and I'm assuming that somebody would have spoken to SPAB to find out what exactly they mean because I'm surprised they've been that vague. Okay, um, I will bring Mr Weimer in but I do need to remind members that um, we, we, rather than looking at what may be, we do actually need to focus purely on the applications that are before us. Uh, but it's a, a relevant question and I don't want to stop anybody asking any questions but just do be mindful of that so we don't get sort of slightly sidetracked. Mr Weimer. I'm just going to answer a question, general, clarify something generally, you can give Mr Lawrence time to think about the question. Just for clarity, because I know this has been raised, was mentioned earlier, as a council we did not consult SPAB directly, nor have we had any conversations with them directly. They, they are a number of preservation societies that quite regularly look through weekly lists of planning applications for authorities and make comments where they feel it's necessary for them to do so. But just for clarity, to the best of my knowledge, we have we certainly didn't consult them and we haven't had any individual conversations with them because they weren't one of the, the statutory consultees. So no, we haven't gone back to have a have a conversation with them to, to get any further details of what they were getting at. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. I think what the SPAB were implying was that the first choice would be thatch because that's what was there. However, it's been correctly stated that they haven't made a site visit and perhaps weren't aware that the roof structure itself and the thatch that is on the building probably only dates from the 1980s. Personally, I would accept corrugated iron as, a, as a, an alternative because that's part of the local um, vernacular tradition. It's been around for nearly 200 years now. Um, the proposal is for Kingspan, which is an insulated, more industrial type of uh, roofing material that you usually see on industrial or very large agricultural buildings. 
that material is something that I believe we could probably condition, but there are other more fundamental concerns which are in the report. Thank you. Uh, members, any further questions? No, nope, can't see any more hands. Okay, so in that case, um, to move this forward, I will move the recommendation as um, described on page 14, which is um, a recommendation is for refusal with the reasons um, laid out there. Is there a seconder for that, please? Happy to second, Chairman. Thank you. Members, we are in debate. Do you wish to speak? Uh, I'm not sure. I've got Councillor Morton, Councillor Hipsey, Councillor Vasham. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to kick this one off. Um, the ward member mentioned that this could be a charming building, and I agree. However, not in the form proposed at present. The application mentioned that the original opening is being closed so that doors do not restrict the available area, but two new openings are being proposed within that same area. Also, that it offers a degree of privacy to both dwellings by closing off that doorway, which to me seems irrelevant given the proximity of the building to the main dwelling and the proposed use. While I appreciate that the building works have been hampered with the recent pandemic, I see little evidence other than the sheeting of any work undertaken to preserve to preserve any of the structure. As it stands, I'm unable to support this application, but would welcome further proposals to enable a suitable use for the building. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I have Councillor Hipsey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this might be more by way of a question, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw it in and leave it hanging if necessary. Um, I'm a little puzzled by, um, if I've got it right, the comment that Mr. Lawrence made a moment ago with the comment and the statement at the bottom of page five, which says the use of modern profiled roof material is unjustified when traditional corrugated iron is a significant feature of the conservation area and the wider rural setting. So I, I'm now confused about whether we would prefer this to be a modern profiled roof material or traditional corrugated iron. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Vachon, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think there's quite a lot of confusion about, about this because obviously there's, there's very little historical evidence of what this building was used for in the past. And we're using, obviously, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking it's, um, it's, it's a barn of some sort. But it, from the site visit, it's, it's extremely small and, and probably barely, barely uh, bigger than a shed. Now, I, I quite like the way that this has been um, prepared for, for, uh, for a building for, for use because it's actually, the, the original structure underneath is still existing, even though they're, they're repurposing, it, repurposing it and putting a new building over the top of it. The original building actually does exist underneath all that. Uh, and I think that's actually going to protect it. The only difference I see is obviously the, the, the doorway which is going through one of the walls, but the rest of the building is there. Now, the, the, the thatched roof that, we, that seems to be a bit of contention here is, is relatively new, as, as, as the officer states, and it's very difficult to see what was there in the, in the past. There's no evidence that was actually a thatched roof in the past. Um, but I, I think um, the way this has been done is very sympathetic, and it's, it's repurposing a building which, um, which will protect it in the future. So I, I would, I would um, uh, go against the officer's recommendation in this case. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. One has to think about this, members, because the OS, second uh, edition of the OS map, showed that this building was in sight then. And given that time, and all the thatch buildings that are in Sanford Courtney generally, uh, this was very likely thatched, and I think the thatching that was done and the roof that was dates from the 1980s was probably a repair of what was there prior to them doing that work. I cannot agree with the planning officer or with the conservation officer about having uh, galvanized iron uh, might be acceptable. I, I feel very strongly that, uh, and I'm saddened that there's not a better uh, scheme and plan come forward for this building. 
if we approve this today in its present form, it will be totally alien to the f main farmhouse because you've got a steel profile roof which has uh, been put forward and there are so many other issues which are uh, will have a detrimental impact not only on the listed farmhouse but also on the general conservation area. The parish clerk said about the uh, number of buildings that have been changed over the years, but you can't pluck those out of the air without us knowing whether they were listed or not. We have to look at the, the, this actual whole site and the, the listed farmhouse of, of Middletown Farm. So I can understand the reasons why they, the applicants want to bring this forward, but I'm very, very disappointed and saddened at the materials being proposed for this application. I think there's been a, a, a lack of uh, imagination in what could be done here in, in doing a really good job uh, to bring this building back into use. And for that reason, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak in debate? Okay, then um, we will take this to the vote, um, reminding members that the what we will be voting for is refusal. If you're voting against, it's because you don't want it to be refused, okay? So all those... Um, Mr. Fevern. Sorry, Chairman, before you, you go to the vote, perhaps I ought to just remind members of the... Um, Par the paragraph of, or section 66 of the local government of uh, the planning and listed building and listed building and conservation areas act and your requirement that if you find harm to the setting you have to give that harm significant weight in your deliberations um, so it's not a question of just it's another factor that goes into the basket on one side of the equation it is something that has to be given significant weight and and um, the report has set out the process by which you have to go through in terms of the NPPF and the statutory test. So once you do find harm, so if you agree with Councillor Pierce that this would be alien to the, far, the setting of the farmhouse, then you have to go through that process and give that harm significant weight. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I just want to clarify with you then, Mr. Fairburn, are you saying there's not been sufficient debate on this? I'm not certain there's been nothing said, which is why I thought I ought to remind members that there is, in fact, um, that extra requirement um, in terms of determining the, the, the planning application and the listed building application. So um, if members haven't said a lot about harm or the setting, uh, I think there's been a lot of focus potentially on the, the building itself, but it's the actual impact on the, the listed farmhouse, because as was said right at the beginning, the farm, the building itself is not listed in its own right it is the farmhouse that's listed and therefore it's the impact of the um, changes to um, that building within the curtilage that affects the setting and if you're satisfied that there's harm caused then you have to go through that process which is set out in the report thank you chairman okay thank you um, <clears throat> so given um if that makes any difference to how people might decide they wish to vote um does anybody wish to speak relevant referring to that matter who hasn't already spoken okay i mean we have it down as one of the reasons for refusal that um uh, uh mr lawrence has um stated that um is regarding the harm and I would imagine that's possibly why members haven't particularly raised it in debate because they weren't necessarily disagreeing with that. So any member wish to, who hasn't already spoken. Okie dokie. Uh, in that case, we will take this to the vote. So all those in favour of the officer recommendation, please show. That's six in favour of refusal, Chair. Against? Two against refusal. Okay, so um, that one then has been refused. Oh, abstention, sorry. With two abstentions, thank you, Chair. Thank you, sorry, I wasn't doing a head count. Um, thank you. Okay, so we now need to move on to the listed building element of this one, which is 30882020 LBC. 
Now, we're obviously not going to have the, 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 the presentation would have been the same, which is why um, the speakers had the opportunity to speak, but we will need to actually um, have the opportunity to ask questions and debate on this particular one regarding the listed building. Members, do you have any questions at all? No, okay. In which case we do, again, we have the officer recommendation for refusal with those reasons as outlined on page um, 21 and the relevant policy numbers. Um, so I will move that. Um, is there a seconder, please? Happy to second, Chairman. Thank you. Um, we are now in debate, members. You wish to speak in debate? Okay. In that case, um, we will need to take that one straight to the vote. So all those in favour of the officer's recommendation, please show. That's six in favour, thank you, Chair. Against? One against, Chair. Two abs uh, uh, abstentions. Three, Three abstentions. Three abstentions, thank you, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so that is refused. So thank you very much indeed for your contributions and for your time. And what you said has been very helpful to the committee. Thank you. So we now move on to item seven, which is the planning appeals update on page 27 of your agenda. Um, Mr. Wyman, was there anything in particular you wish to pick out on this one? Sorry, Chair, I just want to get my, the papers together. Um, I think this, there are a couple of very interesting appeal decisions um, this time. I'll, I'll go through them um, in the order they're in. The Morwellum um, application it was, was, in plain terms, relatively straightforward. The inspector considered that it's a remote lo what was being proposed was remote location outside of towns and villages policy conflict with the strategic aims of the joint local plan. Um, it's, uh, so that was relatively straightforward. The, the second one, um, the 16 Mill Hill cottages, if members haven't read this, this appeal decision, I would really strongly urge you to do so. Because I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it, it's very well. I think it's very well structured from the, the inspector, and I think if I just draw your attention to a couple, just a couple of paragraphs, because I think it, it touches it touches on things that get raised at this this committee quite regularly. Um, so the. So, the, in paragraph 9, that there are other examples of extensions among the cottages, including some side extensions, which are more visually prominent than the proposal in this case would be. And quite, we quite often hear that, well, it's, it's no worse than everything, anything else that's been, been allowed. I'm not aware of the circumstances under which they gain planning permission, but I do not consider they established a convincing precedent for similar development. On the whole, the cottages retain a high degree of architectural consistency as viewed from the street. While the proposal extension would be relatively a relatively small feature in comparison, it would nonetheless represent an incremental change that would erode the distinctive historic appearance of the cottages. And I think that that really kind of summed up what our concerns were with it. And I'm not, so I would I really advise you to read that one. I think it's a very very well a very good structured appeal decision. Um, so I find that I've lost the. The next one is the, the Granny Annex at um, Buckle, uh, Buckle, in Buckle Monocorum. Again, that's that's one. That's an appeal that we've lost. Again, I think it's actually quite a well structured decision. I think there's some lessons that we need. There's officers we need to learn from that in terms of how to deal with um, annex accommodation because we certainly had a concern that it it wasn't. It wasn't really, was it an annex or was it a separate unit? Um, and the inspector covered that. Um, 
and basically said it didn't have an impact on A and B. It was ancillary, and whilst it introduced um, a porch and dormers that weren't on a previous scheme, overall it was acceptable. Um, but I, I think that the, the the phraseology and the conclusions that the inspectors come to in terms of the ancillary element is, is something that we need to look at. And again, it's, it's a, I have no problems with that, the way that was worded. The, the appeal decision that probably raised the most debate from the sales members is one that simply because it was a decision this committee, this committee took. Um, and you, uh, not that long ago, so I think most of you will, will remember it. The, uh, the, the key questions the inspector asks is, is the site suitable for development? Does it meet local need? Did it have cause harm to the character of the countryside? And would the necessary infrastructure be provided to, to serve the development? Without, I'm not going to go through all of those points individually. And if members have got questions, I'll ask them. The interesting thing was that, to me, the, the inspector clearly accepted that it, this isn't a site that would normally be acceptable under TTV 26, but that it was allowable, and this is how the inspector considered it, as an exception site under TTV 27, um, and that the mix is the mix that's been put forward of four over market and six affordable was acceptable, that there was no unacceptable in impact and the unilateral undertaking, the section 106 that was put forward, did provide for the, um, the, the necessary infrastructure payments. Um, now I've reread that decision um, I think that I think that is a different decision to the one that was made last week at Lamerton because I think the split between affordable and, and open market is different. So I, I, I think there's I think there are differences there. And that was my I have to say that was my my first concern. However, it is a it is another or it is a major application that we've lost on appeal and for members who've been. Here for a while, do know that there will be there there are potential implications of that. But I'll happily answer any any questions. Uh, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, uh, Mr. Weimer. I I mean I was disappointed with this uh, decision. To be honest, I mean we're in a situation now where Follygate is going to have about two and a half times as many properties built as was indicated in the JLP. And, you know, I'm just wondering where, when we refuse an application because we know it's over development, you know, how far can we go? Or do, do planning inspectors just look at each application without taking into account what has gone previously? I mean, there seems to be some ambiguity about the need for 20 houses in Folligate. And with the garage development and, and the others, that have been approved by planning inspectors, we're heading towards 50. And I just, you know, from my own point of view, I would like some clarification on how we work on this because it's going against everything that I understand within the JLP. Thank you. I was just going to add in one thing there, as I think this is where it's so essential that um, villages particularly do have a neighbourhood plan. Um, because loss of settlement boundaries um, and the JLP not being a target, it's uh, more of a minimum that um, I think this is an issue we're going to continue to see. Mr. Wyman. You've just stolen my thunder, Chair. I think the JLP, I think the JLP, the JLP numbers, I think we've got to remember that it isn't, it is, it isn't a maximum, it is a kind of a minimum. The, I think the difference, uh, Councillor Pierce, I think the difference between this one and the other Folligate ones is the inspector clearly took the view that this was acceptable under TTV 27 as a rural exception site and not just as a general housing site. So I do not believe it opens the floodgates for lots of speculative developments because I think it's going to be, I think it will be harder for anybody else to come back in for an exception site and still be claiming there's a local need when this one's all, 
already there. So I, I, I share your concerns. I think if this had been allowed under TTV 26, it's just this is an acceptable, sustainable location, I think that would be one thing. But because the inspector clearly put in, the, in his report, the site would not normally be an acceptable site under TTV 26. But because it's delivering 60% affordable housing, it, he considered it, I think it was he, that they considered it as an exception under the, that, that policy. So whilst I share your concerns, I think, I think there's a slight difference with that one than the previous consent that was one on appeal where it wasn't looked at as a, as a rule exception, is my recollection. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions on the appeals? Nope, lovely. Thank you. In that case, we will move on to item eight, which is the update on undetermined major applications. And as members will remember, that is just really about how those applications are processing, not the merits of them. Um, does anybody have any questions on any of these? We've all read what's there. Did Mr. Weimer, did you want to add anything to any of them? No, as usual, I'll, I'll happily try and answer any questions or if when when you see the list coming for the next committee, if you've got any questions you'd like to ask, then if you could give me a, some advance notice, I can then definitely make sure I've got an answer for you, but I've got nothing specifically to add. Okay, no, no hands going up. So we will move on to item nine, which is the three yearly review of gambling statement of licensing principles. Chairman, if I could please, um, before the planning officer goes and our committee is still here, um, I don't, sorry? No, but this is about the gambling. I'm dealing with, with the planning issue which came forward just now, if I may, Chairman. Um, members, committee members, officers, I was very concerned at the allegations that were made by one of the applicants' speakers against our officer. And I have worked with that officer for nearly 20 years. And it does give me great concern that um, this, when somebody has had extended time, that they can uh, come up with uh, allegations and comments in the way they did. To my view, it was to try and bounce you into making a decision in their favor. And I just think it's despicable of what happened. So members, please be aware in future that you know our planning officers in the main know what they're doing. I don't always agree with them, but I thought today was dreadful in the way that uh, the applicant put forward their presentation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. I think uh, I, I'm, I am just going to make a response to that, and perhaps just to bring a bit of balance. I think at the end of the day, if anybody has an issue then there is a complaints procedure which that can be followed through on. Um, I believe that members are experienced enough in their training to be able to determine a planning um, application on material reasons and will disregard anything that is not material. I know I have every confidence in the officers that present to this committee and the officers that support this committee. Um, and I will continue to have that confidence. So while I don't, I can, I can see Councillor Hipsey's hand is up. I don't particularly want to get into um, a, a, a sort of a lengthy debate on this, but um, because, it, it, you know, I, I think it is something we need to be very careful of and very sensitive about. Um, but Mr Fairburn, did you wish to make a response? Yes, Chairman, I was going to say this is a matter that we're now in a public meeting. Um, and the item is now done and dusted. It's no, there's no discussion on the agenda. Uh, we should move on. If we ha need to have a, a consideration and discussion about um, performance of officers and otherwise, other, um, then I think that's a matter to be taken out, out of the public arena and dealt with otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Noted. Okay. We will therefore move on to um, agenda item nine, which is a three yearly review. Um, and... Um, uh, sorry, the three yearly review of the gambling statement of licensing principles. And I will pass it over to Mrs. Stacey to present the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So thank you for allowing me to your committee today. Um, I'm here today because it is a legal requirement under the Gambling Act 2005 to update our gambling statement of principles every three years. 
This statement sets out the licensing authority's approach to the regulation of gambling within our local area. In addition, this policy also must promote the three licensing objectives under the Gambling Act 2005, which are preventing gambling from being a source of crime or disorder, being associated with crime or disorder, or being used to support crime, ensuring that gambling is conducted in a fair and open way, and protecting children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited by gambling. While the policy statement may set out a general approach to the exercise of functions under the Act, it shouldn't override the right of any person to make an application and to have that application considered on its own merits. Additionally, the policy statement must not undermine the right of any person to make representations on an application or to seek a review of a licence where provision has been made for them to do so. The current statement of principles um, will still be in effect until the 31st of January 2022. We therefore need to ensure that an updated version is approved and in effect before this date. The draft policy for consideration is at Appendix A. We have undertaken a consultation with responsible authorities, local gambling businesses and other relevant organisations as per the requirements and a list of those is at Appendix B. So we have come to you today to request that you consider the draft policy and the responses received during the consultation period to then hopefully recommend to Council to adopt the policy at the meeting on the 30th of November, subject to any further changes you may deem necessary. As the statement was updated in depth uh, during the last review three years ago, it hasn't been seen as necessary to make too many significant changes to the document. Appendix C summarises the changes which have been made to the policy from the current version. Updates have been made to reflect the Gambling Commission's new guidance and codes of practice. Other main changes include more information and detail on our expectations relating to the separation of licensed premises, an update to our expectations in relation to children and vulnerable persons. We also have a new section on premises license plans and further detail which we now require including the positioning of gaming machines. So during the consultation period, we received four responses, which are at Appendix D. You'll see that two of these are from Oakhampton Hamlets Parish Council and Tavistock Town Council, just to confirm their support of the document and haven't made any further comments. Councillor Yelland kindly pointed out the new name for Citizens Advice, and we have now amended that. And finally, Gamble Aware, which is a charity which helps to reduce gambling-related harm, sent us some useful information and links. Um, some of these are more relevant to the Public Health Authority and um, some of the documents they recommended we had already taken into consideration during our review in 2018. But we have updated the document following their recommendation that licensing authorities sign post people to the National Gambling Helpline and we've in, included their website and links to that information, as I've confirmed at Appendix D. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have or to discuss any other potential changes you think may be required. Um, if the committee is satisfied with the policy statement, um, I'd request that this is recommended to Council on the 30th of November for adoption to come into effect on the 31st of January 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? Councillor Renders, was that your hand? I wasn't sure. Thank you. Yep. Just a very quick one. Um, I did read this last night. Um, what does it actually replace and what are the um, changes, if any? Are there many changes? It's, I was just seeing to be reading what I remember from last time. And I might have just, it might have just been very late at night, but I was just thinking, I've seen all this. Okay. Oh, is it? I'm sorry. I didn't so, know. I'll um, shut up. Ignore that then. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've summarised the changes in I think it's Appendix C as you'll see there, there aren't too many significant changes um, have you got any questions about the changes at the moment? Uh, just checking that actually people at the end of the room can, can actually hear through the microphone system just being absolutely sure <laughs> Councillor Renders, did you have any further queries on that? Because Mr. Stacey had actually already taken us through that bit, so perhaps you didn't, weren't able to hear it. Any further questions then, Councillor Renders? No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Having a funny five minutes, I think.
Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, any other members? Any other questions? Nope. Okie dokie. Um, okay. So um, I move the recommendation, which is um, on page 31 as described.